there's been a lot of hoopla over Rob Bell and his book. And I'm just going to go ahead and ask this, and then let's talk about it freely and openly, since everybody else is talking about it freely and openly. How could a loving God send people to hell? Let, let me jump in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's probably one of the three top questions in fifth, this is my 50th year in ministry that's been asked. But I want to show you how shallow that question is. In 50 years, not one person has ever, Christian even, has ever asked me this. How can a holy, righteous God allow a sinful individual into his presence? It's unbelievable. It's always, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? But just legitimate question, how can a holy, righteous God allow a sinful individual into his presence? And you know the problem is? Even with Rob Bell everything, Almost all of our theology is anthropocentric, anthro-man-centric centered. It's man-centered. Most preaching today is man-centered when it ought to be initially theocentric, theo-God-centered. And one of my great things in life is getting Christians to change from being anthropocentric to theocentric. And um, God never sent anyone to hell, but he allows people to go to hell. And, um, be, oh boy. I couldn't do this in three minutes. I wrote a whole book on it. Um, God, there's many things God can't do. Uh, people say, well, can God build a stone so big that he can't move it? Uh, there's many things that God can't do. God cannot perform any reality inconsistent with his basic nature. God cannot lie. Why? Because his very nature, God is true. An attribute of God is not a part of God. You don't take all of his attributes, Adam, sum total equals God. We say God is love, God is righteous, God is holy. Those aren't parts of God. Each one of those is something that is true of God in his very nature. As a result, God is limited by his nature. He's revealed that. God cannot lie. Why? Because he's truth. He cannot act unholy. Why? Because he's holy. He must act justly. Why? Because he is just. And here God would approach man saying, I created you to share my glory with you. I'm passionate about a relationship with you. And he approaches us with his love to save us. But God is not only love. God is holy. God is just. His very nature had to destroy us for the ways of sin is death. We would approach man, God. There's within every man a God-shaped vacuum. We approach God for salvation, God's love to save us. And God's love would want to save us, but his very nature had to destroy us. The ways of sin is death. Why? God is holy and righteous. So God made a decision in eternity past. He's going to become the God-man. He became that through Jesus. Jesus was just as much man if he'd never been God, just as much God if he'd never been man. And because he was not only man but infinite God, he had the infinite capacity to take the sins of the world upon himself. And when he went to the cross, the holy, just, righteous nature of God was poured out on his Son. And when Jesus said it is finished, that's what Romans 3 talks about, propitiation. The holy, just, righteous nature of God was propitiated, which means satisfied. And you might say God was set free through Jesus to bring him, any one of us into a relationship with him who chose to be. So you've got to balance that off with God is a God of love. He's also a holy, just, righteous God. I got to get passionate about something, and that's one. Go on, Great. go ahead. That was the, um, yeah, I think Rob Bell. And I read the book, and, and really, it's 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 kind of the next extension of the whole emergent mindset that that uh, from a postmodern gospel that you'd cut the cord with objective reality, with truth, so to speak. Uh, I think you could sum it up if you took John three sixteen the way he kind of a paraphrase of that book. It would be like this: For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whether you believe or not, you won't perish unless you want to. So he actually says in the book that he, he gives more than one lifetime that we in eternity will have some kind of other chance to believe, and that if you insist on going to hell, he'll let you go. So again, there's, it's kind of a, a fictitious kind of patchwork tapestry of things if you read the thing. Uh, I agree completely with Josh that the holiness, it's, see, man's got a legal problem. Sin sin is breaking God's law. And so God is not just love. We talked about that in that last session. We talked about when people paint God as holy love. It's his caricature. Holy, starting with a W. Holy love versus holy love. H-O-L-Y. That when you don't see him as holy love, then your whole version of love is perverse. 
And that's why people, spirituality today is, you know, people say I'm spiritual. That means is, again, they pray before they have premarital sex. There's no sense of the righteous law. Or that. So when God's law is broken, then that law has to, there has to be, that's a debt. If you have a law but no punishment, you cease to have a law, just a suggestion. So Christ is the only one that came to pay the legal price for sin. Uh, if you asked, on the other hand, if somebody says, you know, how could a loving God send somebody to hell? I'll respond and say, do you think that everyone goes to heaven? Now, as soon as we ask that question back, does everybody go to heaven? I've, I've very rarely met anybody that's going to let everybody into heaven. Yeah, Hitler, they're going to let somebody out. And then so if, as soon as somebody says, not every, uh, as soon as somebody says, not everyone goes to heaven, then they've said really two things, or maybe it begs the question of two things. Number one, who decides? And what's the criteria? Is it just my Facebook friends? Is it just my, the people I like? No, no. So, so people deep down know that there is some judgment coming. 